Our scripture reading today comes from 1 Timothy, oddly enough, from the sixth chapter, 6 through 12 and 17 through 19. Of course, there is great gain in godliness combined with contentment. For we brought nothing into the world so that we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with these. But those who want to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. And in their eagerness to be rich, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. But as for you, man of God, shun all of this. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and for which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. As for those who are, who are in the present age that are rich, command them not to be haughty or to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but rather on God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, generous and ready to share, thus storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of the life that really is life. May God add a blessing to the reading of the Holy Scriptures. Will you join me in prayer? Lord God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Good morning. It is good to be here today. What would you do if you won the multi-million dollar lottery. We pass by billboards and we see in the stores when the jackpot reaches like 500 million or 700 million. Didn't we have one recently that was 1.4 billion or something like that? What are our plans with that money? And don't act like you don't have plans, I know you do. I have fantasized about that for decades. I would, of course, give 10% to the church, as we all should be doing. I would make sure that my parents and siblings and aunts and uncles and cousins get another 10% to be divvied up among them. New house, maybe cars that work, an unlimited sports package on direct TV. <laughs> maybe a live Razorback to hang out in my backyard. For the rest of the money, I would set up investments and make sure that we retain generational wealth and not worry about a single thing. If I'm going to be honest, I would feel good about helping others. In fact, I would help others a lot. But the fantasy that I have involves caring for me and eliminating my personal financial stress. Last year, America spent $70 billion on lottery tickets. It is more than we spend on sports tickets, books, video games, movies, and music combined. People love the lottery because it represents a chance to find real happiness. But reality hits hard for those few select lottery winners. You've heard stories time and time again. I'm going to share a couple with them. One man went broke four years after winning $315 million dollars lost a daughter and a granddaughter to drug overdoses, was robbed and shot at twice. I wish I had torn up that ticket, he says. Another woman won $224 million and wrote a book about how most of her relationships changed. They changed into vampires trying to suck the life out of you. She also wishes she had never won. Every single time I hear stories like that, I always think to myself, well, surely that wouldn't happen to me, though, right? Our entire culture, our entire economic system keeps reinforcing the fact that we need more in order to be content. To be satisfied with what we have seems to be counter to what we value as a culture. You know, they've done survey after survey asking people how much money they would need, how much more money they would need to be content. Like, not rich or wealthy or anything, but how much would it take for you to breathe just a little easier and be content? In almost all circumstances, the number is about 20% more than they have. 
If you're making $2,000 a month, well then $2,400 a month, that's, that will allow me to be content. If you're bringing in $15,000 a month, well $18,000 would really put me where I need to be. It's always more, and it's just beyond our reach. And it's reinforced all around us so that when we encounter something like this text that talks about being content with what you currently have, it's confusing because we never get that message anywhere else. There's a well-known story out there in many different forums. You've probably heard a version of this, but there was a wealthy businessman who bought a business for fishing. And he was going to make this the best fishing enterprise out there. So he wanted to talk to the best like, fishermen around to see how best he can run his business. And he asked around, and the general consensus was that Frank was the best at what he does, best fisherman. So the wealthy businessman goes out early in the morning to watch Frank do his thing. Frank knew exactly where to go, and in no time at all, he had had his catch. The wealthy business owner was so impressed, but he wanted to watch others as well. So about noon, he sees Frank on the beach under an umbrella having a drink. He approaches Frank and he says, what are you doing? Why aren't you out there getting more fish? They said you're the best. Why are you sitting here? And Frank says, I caught enough for today. So I stopped. But don't you see, the businessman says, with your talent, you could bring in even more and sell in bulk. You could generate enough income to buy two boats and then three and then a whole fleet of boats. You could retire and live off your fishing enterprise. And Frank looked confused and he said, well, then what? He said, well, then you could do anything you wanted. Frank replied, like sit on the beach and have a drink midday. It's staggering that we get so conditioned by our culture, that we can't see a better path to contentment. And because we live in this world where people try to get things at all costs because they think they don't have enough, we have nefarious attempts that we need to be aware of. People trying to take things that do not belong to them. Kay Gerthet, a member of Forest Park, I came over with the Eastside Group, um, sent me a text earlier this week. She said, I got the following from a 918 number. So then she's not going to read the text that she got. Hi, Kay. I pray that you and your family are safe and well. Do you have a moment? I have a request I need you to handle discreetly. I am currently busy in a prayer session. No calls, just reply to my text, Pastor Bill Hem. This isn't some warranty car thing or lowering your credit rate or something like that just to get a hold of your credit card information. This is someone who has called her by name, connected her to my congregation, and then used my name in the scam. I freaked out, and I called her, and she said, well, I know that wasn't you, but I thought you should be aware of this. And so I texted several of my minister friends and said, Did you, have you ever gotten stuff like this? And a few of them said, yeah, that's, that's been going around. So I'd like to take this opportunity to tell you that Pastor Bill will never ask for your credit card information <laughs> via text. <laughs> Although he does accept cash. No, I'm just teasing. No, I'm just teasing. <laughs> the scripture today deals with finding contentment with what we have. Striving to always get that extra 20% so that you are content, it's a mirage. You will never, ever get there. There is great gain in godliness combined with contentment. For we brought nothing into this world so that we can take nothing out of it. I don't normally preach on this aspect of the movement, but I really need to. I need to do this more. The opening scripture that Eric read and so many others throughout our Bible, both Old and New Testaments, talk about not accumulating goods and finding contentment with what we have. Jesus' parables dealt with money more than any other subject. And it's because it's a mirage. All of it is. It does not lead to fulfillment. The problem is that everything around us tells us different. Who's heard of the following movies? Ace Ventura, Pet Detective, The Nutty Professor, Liar Liar, Bruce Almighty, and Evan Almighty. Raise your hand if you've heard those movies. Yeah, of course. The director and or producer, depending on the film, 
of these films is named Tom Shadiak. He actually started out as the youngest writer for Bob Hope, interestingly enough. And he kind of put Jim Carrey on the map as well. Jim Carrey had done a few things before that, but Ace Ventura really skyrocketed Jim Carrey. So Tom had had all this success, and the offers for movies were flooding in. I mean, all those movies were great movies, by the way. Um, and so he had fame and success and money, had a 16,000 square foot mansion. Everything looked like the American dream and all that it had promised, but it didn't lead to higher happiness. And he gave it all up. I mean, he gave every bit of it up. He actually moved into a trailer park in Malibu with just a few possessions, and contentment overwhelmed him. He was finally at peace. And he actually made a documentary about it called I Am. It's a fascinating journey if you are interested in documentaries, where he explores why he was able to reach this level where all the money in the world couldn't get him there. And in this documentary, he spoke with many different faith leaders, like interfaith leaders in different faith communities around the world, Christianity and Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, and Judaism. All of them had teachings that backed up what he experienced when he gave everything away. He found that the ancient mystics, including Jesus, were right. Many of you know that I participate in a meditation group that meets here on Sunday afternoons. I've always been curious about practices related to Buddhism, um, practices that um, I learned about in seminary a little bit. And there's absolutely nothing in Buddhist teachings that go against anything that Jesus taught. And so I thought, I, I would give this a try. This was a couple years ago. And I really do like the community that has been formed there. It's led by a retired Episcopal priest. But here's what surprised me, and it continues to surprise me every single time it happens. I'm shocked at just how much Jesus is referenced in our sittings and in our discussion, because he saw this as well. Being content with what you have and finding joy in simplicity might feel new age and hippie-like, I guess, but it's actually quite ancient, and it's all throughout our scriptures. See, happiness is based on circumstances. As long as everything is going well, we are happy. Things at home, things at work, things at church, but the problem we run into rarely is that all things in life do not go perfectly. So we lose the happiness. But contentment is based on faith. Contentment is finding joy no matter where the circumstances lead you. Happiness is based on things external. Contentment is based on things eternal. And the contentment, while it leads to peace and joy with our current circumstances, does something else as well. It frees up our attention. Once you stop trying to achieve that mythical 20% increase in income or whatever else you're trying to get to, it frees you up to look past yourself. It allows you to see the needs of others. It allows us to see the kingdom work that needs to be done. It's the reordering that Jesus has been talking about and preaching about time and time again. Be content with what you have, godliness combined with contentment is holy. Thanks be to God. Amen.